Thank you to uh, SMAC for having a neurologist share the floor. It's uh, an honor to be here and speak to you. Uh, I'm going to give you a roadmap of the talk um, so you know where we're going and what we're going to cover. Essentially, we're going to talk a bit about the criminalization of healthcare and gross negligence. And interestingly, in Australia, this, Australia has adopted quite a lot of the UK approach. And I will be talking about the UK simply because the cases I'm discussing occurred there. There was a global outcry, um, which actually came a lot from Australia and New Zealand um, after one of these cases, which I'm sure will be very familiar to you. Um, so it's interesting that this has gone from one country and has spread across the globe. I want to ask the question whether some individuals are more vulnerable than others. I want to talk about excess regulation, how that feels and our functioning, the global situation, and, and actually, let's be practical, how you avoid getting into these circumstances in the first place. I hope to give you some practical tips. I want to talk about the cover-up versus the just culture, because just culture is where we should be going, not only for us, but most importantly for our patients and our learning points and learn not blame. So I start with David Sello. I don't know how many people have heard of him, but this is how a neurologist with no legal training but a great support group um, started a campaign to overturn this man's conviction. He was convicted for manslaughter just around the time that, the, that SMAC came into being in 2013. It was in a private hospital in the UK, in Harrow, and it was, uh, involved a gentleman who just had a knee replacement, and he, everything appeared to go well. Five days afterwards, he developed some abdominal pain. And David was asked to see him. At that point, he was under the care of an orthopaedic surgeon. Now, it actually transpired that this gentleman had a perforated bowel, and over the course of the next 24 hours, there were two charges that subsequently became laid at David's door when the patient died a few days later. Number one, you did not take this man to theater quickly enough or perform a CT scan. And number two, you did not ensure the pr timely provision of antibiotics in the, in, the, in the case of sepsis. There was a team in the hospital, there was a hospital, but it was the surgeon that went to jail on a manslaughter charge, unlawful killing of the patient. I wish to pay tribute to Mr. James Hughes and his family at this point for his tragic, this was a tragic death that could have been avoided, but it wasn't all David's fault. This is the drug chart, very important. What's a neurologist got to do with a colorectal case? Um, well, it's very interestingly, as a neurologist, I'm obsessive about reading charts. And I didn't know David, but he was the senior surgeon in our hospital, and he was the go-to man if you got into trouble. And so I wondered why he was ending up in prison at the old... Uh, he'd gone to actual... He'd gone to Belmarsh. It's where England sends its rapists and terrorists, and then to a high-security prison. And he'd had a completely unblemished career. This was summary of the case, and this was what the prosecution expert said at trial. So we had a completely ridiculous um, risk of death given to the jury of 4% in a man who was actually, although there was not lack of the uh, provision of antibiotics could have been better, he was also on dibigatran, an irreversible anticoagulant at the time. There was no way that uh, they wouldn't have encountered severe bleeding at operation in a gentleman who was then subsequently found to have cirrhosis at operation, not known about beforehand, who was anemic and had an emergency perforated sigmoid colon to fare. So you can see the kind of evidence that was presented at a criminal trial and how bad it was. This was his trials. This was what happened. We launched an out-of-time appeal. It took us three years to quash it. It was all, everything was set against us, but remarkably it was quashed because the judge, uh, the appeal court decided that the jury had been misdirected rather than any of other, other, our evidence, which frankly should have been presented by the defense team at trial and wasn't. And then he was totally exonerated by the MPTS. So there was a man, an innocent man, who went to prison on a gross negligence manslaughter charge. Let me just tell you a little bit about gross negligence manslaughter. Essentially, people worry that this could be any error that they commit. It isn't. 
There has to be a breach. You have to have a duty of care towards that patient. The actual breach and the negligence has to be truly exceptionally bad. And that was the modernization of the law that we achieved in the Selu case, that it can't just be a simple error. It has to be an error that is so criminal it is requiring of a prison, of a, of a conviction. This was the second case that many of you will know about involving um, Hadiza Bawagaba, and it involved an innocent child, Jack Adcock, who came into the Leicester Royal Infirmary dehydrated, sickness and diarrhoea. Um, he had signs at the time of possible sepsis. She came back to work. She'd had lack of induction. She'd just come back from maternity ward. She was covering six wards on four floors. She was unfamiliar with the hospital. The, uh, there was a consultant that stayed, but a duty consultant wasn't immediately available, although they could, she could have contacted him on the phone. Her skills weren't as good as they should have been simply because she should have had more of team support and she was supervising junior doctors. There was a whole raft of systemic failures on that day, a blood computer system that didn't work, and several arrests. And she was unprepared um, for such um, a baptism of fire. And she was working in a hospital with a don't complain culture, with poor staffing levels and agency nurses. This was the debrief. There simply wasn't one from the consultant who should have supported her better. It was all blamed on her. This was what happened. This is not how you conduct a mentorship. And the hospital did conduct a root cause analysis, and it found that it should have taken 79 actions, which meant that this should never have happened. But guess what? It all got blamed on the humans, didn't it? And we're very familiar with that, aren't we? And this was the protracted journey that she went through, along with a nurse who was also convicted. And so she was convicted, not sent to prison. But then the General Medical Council tried to strike her off, and she was struck off. But thousands of doctors in the UK fought this, fought the case against her erasure, and she was subsequently restored to the medical re re register after the appeal court agreed with them. She's yet to go back to work, but we hope that will happen. I'd like to pay tribute to the family of Ad Jack Adcock. This was a tragic death that should have been avoided. So why are we blaming individuals when actually we should be looking at systems? Why is this happening? Well, frankly, the easy answer to that is much easier to actually prosecute and convict an individual than to go after a hospital. There's not been a corporate manslaughter prosecution of a hospital in the UK, and if you ask the police why, because they did look into it, they'll tell you it's way too difficult, much easier to go after the individuals. So we have this cover-up culture, don't we? And have a look at that, because it's not, obviously, it's, it's not funny. It's something that we can probably recognize elements of that within our own institution, can't we? It's certainly what happened in the Bauer case. Lots of um, blame went on. Lots of people getting in with their first version of events. A consultant knew that the lactate was 11, the pH was 7.08, but told the court that it was very important that he should be instructed to go and see uh, Jack with those levels by his, his trainee registrar. And, um, you know, a lot of these things, this was a team mistake, this was a systems error, this was something that shouldn't have happened, but lots of people were to blame, and there was a hospital behind it with lots and lots of systems errors going on, and yet the individuals got the blame. So I don't know how you feel, but I feel like this. I feel like I could be got by a coroner, I could be got by some hired guns from a prosecution turning up, I could be got by a regulator. I could try and whistleblow, but if I do, I know I'm at risk of actually possibly losing my career, and we've had instances across the United Kingdom of that happening. I could be blamed by my institution, and I'm trying to deal with this really complex human machinery in the middle of it. Why am I a doctor? And why is this happening? If you look over the last 10 years, over the last 10 years exclusively, it is only black and ethnic minority doctors in the UK who are actually being convicted of this charge. Why is that? Why does it seem that the color of their scheme means that they're more likely to be convicted? So, when we actually look at the real effect on us, do you remember at the beginning I said I want to look at what the effect on our functionality is? What I meant was, how are we supposed, how do we react? And I'm just um, highlighting the case of Abdullah Amin, which actually happened in my own hospital. A nurse who set himself on fire 
after uh, there was a patient complaint and he stuck up for his colleagues and a hospital investigation that blamed him and he ended up killing himself. I paid tribute to him and his family. Why is this happening? And then we look at Rebecca Black, her husband, a GP, had depression and committed suicide. The qualities which make us a good and caring doctor are also the qualities which place us at higher risk of mental illness. Why is it some of our regulators appear so accusatory? And why are there such unacceptable delays in investigations with concerns leading to possibly high risk of suicide? Remember, David went to prison for not acting quickly, apparently, between 24 hours. Yet some of these are taking months and months of where you are being de-skilled if you're under investigation. And yet that's a system, and somehow that's acceptable. Well, it's not. And why is it? that there are 35 deaths through suicide between 2005 and 2013 of doctors under investigation. And why is it that we don't even know when it comes to nurses? We only know death under investigation of 15 in the last few years. They can't tell us if these were suicide or not. We're not alone, are we? Australia stood up and said, why is this happening with Bauer-Garber? But across the world, in Denmark, Russia and Mexico, in Mexico, we've had doctors charged with murder when patients have died. And Russia, 200 causes of doctors being lined up on iatrogenic manslaughter cases. So I want to just show you, this is what Bauer Garber says herself about, and she's here to talk to you today by pre-agreed video. And I also, um, you'll see a featured Newsnight program with myself, and Mrs. Adcock and Evan Davis on Newsnight talking about the case. Like most of you, I went into medicine because I have a passion for it. One of the purposes of my life is to serve the community. When we graduated and took the Hippocratic Oath, we said we will treat patients to the best of our ability. One of the greatest difficulties that we have as medics is dealing with the death of a patient. However, nothing in medical school prepares us for criminal investigations. When I agreed to come up with Khalid on the 18th of February, 2011, I never realized that I was going to start that journey. A year later, I was arrested by the police and questioned because of an investigation into gross negligence manslaughter of my actions on that day. I recall my immediate fear was what was happening to my two-week-old daughter, but another bigger fear I had was the possibility of going to prison. I was relieved two months later when the police informed me that the case has been closed. However, whilst I was on call on the 17th of December, 2014, my consultant informed me that I had just been charged with gross negligence manslaughter. I remember being speechless and not knowing what would follow. In November 2015, I was convicted and I recall the police officers putting the handcuffs on my hand. At that point, something changed inside me. I was placed in a cell for some hours while they discussed my bail conditions. And in that time, I remember writing about what will happen to my children and made other plans in case I was sentenced to prison. I am grateful for being here today. I'm very grateful for your support. And I also feel fortunate to be given an opportunity to practice medicine. My hope is that we can work together as a community to improve the working conditions of junior doctors and also improve patient safety. Thank you. You're worried about what happens to medical professionals if, if, if 
you know, doctors are struck off for this kind of thing? Well, I think it's sad. We're actually all on the same side. Doctors, no, doctors are on the same side as patients here. What we want is a safe culture. And the only way you really get a safe culture is actually a no-blame culture, where people can be frank about the errors that they made, and they can discuss them and not feel challenged. But and that they come out in the open and say, I did this wrong. That's the only way that you actually improve patient safety. You would agree that there are some errors that are too gross to... to Absolutely. To such gross negligence, you would say, sorry, this, you're just obviously not fit for this, for this job. Yes. Doctors get struck up for fraud. But, but in this particular case, the MPTS has heard all the evidence, that's the tribunal, I mean, they did, find the the fence. they did find that there were grotesque errors. I mean, they in the did. day, and they, they said it was the fact that she had and that she redeemed had, herself by, yes, by trying she to. Had, she did nothing. Was, she has had honest failure. And basically, honest failure should not be rewarded with, with punishment of retribution. She has been suspended. She's, been, she's had trial by media. A lot of things have happened. Would you, let her, would you let her, this is Nikki's question, yeah. would you let her look after your child? I absolutely would. So, um, not over. Um, just to clarify, it was interesting, the two cases are similar in the sense that Hadiza, Miss Jack died of sepsis, he had strep sepsis, and Hadiza was convicted for failure to um, realise the significance of those blood reading. Remember, the consultant knew about those as well, and a failure to act quickly enough in his care and treat a so-called barn door case of sepsis. There is a range of opinion about that. Nobody is saying that Jack received wonderful care, should have been better care, but should she have been convicted and threatened with a prison sentence? We say no with this recent um, publication which compared the UK and New Zealand systems. Um, we believe it simply wouldn't have happened in New Zealand and in industry, inter interestingly, here in Australia, uh, there have been no doctors or nurses convicted of uh, recently of um, gross negligence manslaughter because Australia t seems to take a different approach and understands that actually learn not blame, looking at systems is the way to make patients safer. So how again can we avoid a conviction for gross negligence and uh, gross negligence manslaughter? Always take good notes. Exhibit safe reflective practice. Think about the tension between reflection being honest with patients, the so-called duty of candor, and fear of prosecution. Get in very, very clean in with this serious instant framework. You know, you're actually looking at those, every, every statement that you write when you're doing a hospital serious incident report, remember that that could be something you have to defend a few years later. So make sure you've got your facts and make sure that you could always defend what's on that piece of paper and that you have all the medical notes in front of you, whatever stresses are available. Communicate well with the family. If you do that, you're much less likely to be in this situation, although this wasn't Hadiza or all David's fault. Get a good legal team who understand really all the human factors that were present at the time of what was going on. Make sure that all the experts consider that human factor analysis, and that's what England's changed as a result of the Bauer-Garber incident. And again, I go back to good notes with safe, reflected practice as a way that you can actually make sure this doesn't happen to you. But frankly, it could happen to any of us, which is why I'm here today talking to you about it. And let's go for that just culture. A busy slide, but essentially a repeat of what you've seen. But it talks about admitting, reflecting, and learning from errors, and making sure that we get organisational learning, and us and our organisations and our managers and everyone that lives and works within that organisation taking personal responsibility. And finally, I just want to mention learn.main because I've got a very special message for you today from Don Berwick. This is the first time that you will have heard this message, not the subject, but this particular message. It's being shown at SMAC for the first time. It's part of the Learn Not Blame campaign from the Doctors' Association UK. I want to mention fellow SMAC, um, Dr. Sami Batrauden, who runs that organisation, and Cicely Saunders, who runs Learn Not Blame. If patients are looking for a doctor who has never made a mistake, they simply won't find one. Hi, I'm Don Berwick. I'm President Emeritus and Senior Fellow at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement in Boston, Massachusetts. I just want to share with you how excited I am uh, by the Learn Not Blame campaign. I thoroughly endorse it, and uh, it's the right thing to do. Um, when you're trying to improve anything in the world, including healthcare, 
you live in a paradox, and the paradox is that on the one hand, things are not as we wish them to be. Things go wrong all the time. We have tremendous documentation on the levels of defect in healthcare, patient safety issues, indignities, lack of reliability, waste, um, uh, problems in equity and, uh, and um, disparities in health and, and healthcare. Um, these must be fixed. It's our job to, to do that. Uh, the paradox is that it's all happening while we're trying our very best to do the right thing. Uh, an impoverished view of the way to make healthcare better is the view that we need to try harder. That uh, if we just point enough fingers and create enough contingencies, rewards and punishments, increase the pressure, that somehow, frankly, magically, things will get better. That is wrong. Most of the healthcare workforce every single day is trying its hardest to do their very best. When things go wrong, more than the vast majority of time, the causes lie in the systems of work in which we are embedded. Uh, when things go wrong, the defects are embedded in the designs of the work we do. And so the proper way to improve is design and redesign, constant learning. So all the time we're working together to find out the causal systems that lead to the defects in which we get trapped. And by the way, also to invent totally new things with capacities that the current system does not have. Blame, pressure, trying harder, poisons the effort for learning. And until we learn that, until leaders and all of us working in healthcare understand that it is the joint endeavor of learning that will get us to the healthcare we want, there's no way we can make the progress we need to make. So your campaign is crucial. It will change minds, it will change approaches, and it will lead to far greater success than outmoded ways of thinking. Uh, so your title tells the story, learn not blame. Thank you. Thank you for listening.